very much. So, hello, uh, my name is Jamie Cross. I am currently the Vice Chair of IWGP Game Workers. Um, just a quick few thank yous and little bits and pieces. Uh, this talk, this slide deck, was a bit of a collaborative creation. So I just want to give a quick thank you to the other people who helped out with it and the elected, already tongue-tied, elected committee in the branch. Um, and if you want to contact us for any reason, we have a general email there, which is gameworkers at iwgb.co.uk. And we are reachable on Twitter at iwgb underscore gw. I am very aware that I have a sort of heavy Scottish accent and might speak very quickly. So if people need me to slow down a little or go over anything else, please just let me know. That's fine by me. So we're going to cover a few topics, uh, not in a huge amount of detail, so we don't overload people. Um, we're going to quickly go over what is a union, what do they do, especially IWGB game workers <laughs> in this instance. Um, we'll cover a couple workers' rights that you may or may not know about, and we'll do a little bit of how you can get involved in union and organising that side of things as well. So I suppose first main question is, what is a union? And there is a very dry legal definition in the UK, it's an organisation with members, usually workers or employees, that, and the union looks after their interests in a myriad of different ways, such as negotiating agreements, discussing big changes, like helping with redundancy processes for members, uh, any employment concerns, and being representatives during disciplinary or grievance meetings or anything like that. Uh, but, and one thing that we, we should really clarify and hammer home is a lot of people think that by joining a union is basically a very passive legal subscription, for lack of a better term. You just pay your dues, that's it. You don't need to worry about anything else. You just call on the man as you need them. And we, I suppose, at IWGB Game Workers are what you'd call a solidarity union. We're not just about being passive. A union is very much about its members. Its core members make up the union. It's not something that should be uddled or as some third party company that you, you get to deal with things on your behalf. It's about engaging those people that join, encouraging and empowering them to take matters into their own hand, argue their own battles, and basically improve the working conditions of not only themselves, but other people in various companies. So on our own, for ourselves, IWG, we're starting again, IWGV Game Workers, um, are part of the IWGB, which is the Independent Workers of Great Britain. It started up a few years ago um, based in London. I think it was with either one of the university branches for their cleaners and facilities or their security guards. But they campaigned to have people brought in-house instead of being on zero-hour contracts, and they won. And since then, there's been a multitude of other branches that have sprung up. So as mentioned, there's a cleaners and facilities branch and a security guards branch. There's ourselves, which is game workers. There are the couriers branch. So people who do deliveries for like DoorDash or Deliveroo, Uber Eats. There's the UPHD, which is Uber drivers and the other sort of app-based taxi services. <laughs> we... More, some of the more recent ones are we now have a yoga teachers branch and a nannies and no pairs branch. And one of our biggest ones and one of the biggest ones that we've had the union as a whole had has been with the foster carers branch, which managed to legally win a case where foster carers in Scotland were basically given employment rights. So, yeah, they cover a rather wide sort of group of people, but it's really interesting just in terms of kind of organising perspective, seeing what people do and what the sometimes similar situations different people have, even if they're in fairly different employment. Uh, yeah, different, I've forgotten the word I was going to say, different types of employment, spheres of employment, work. <laughs> uh, so we have been a branch of the union since 2018, December 2018 was when we officially started up. We've got hundreds of members at uh, dozens of workplaces in all parts of the UK. Um, our elected committee is all game workers. Our entire 
branch is made up by, by volunteers, but we last year were able to hire our first staff member and we are actually looking to hire a replacement for them because they've left to do their PhD and coincidentally are joining another one of the IWGB branches as a member of the back of it as well. So we're quite, quite all encompassing in a way, I guess. But as I mentioned, we are not this weird third party ident identity object thing. I'm really mixing up my words, sorry. Company, it's for the workers, by the workers. One of the things that we aim to do is basically identify who is out there, what problems are, do they have within the games industry, then organize, how do we bring these people together? How do we get them speaking to each other? Which is one of the main obstacles when it comes to basically organizing in general, but game workers or games people, especially in Scotland, it can be difficult to get them out and about. Uh, as a side note, I help organize some game meetups up here in Scotland, and it's very difficult to get people to travel between Dundee, Edinburgh, or Glasgow, which is always a bit of a nightmare, especially when you compare it to places like London, where people are just like, yeah, it's an hour in the train, it's fine and dandy, but an hour in the train up here is just like apparently very impossible. <laughs> and one of the third things we do is training people, turn them into organizers, but also in a few other different methods as well, um, which I can discuss later. We take things on on a case by case basis. So one of the things that we actually established was our own internal casework group. So IWGB does have its own legal team and its own set of caseworkers and its own administrative team who do handle quite a lot of work where we essentially organize the workers. But we wanted to take on some of that work ourselves so that we could essentially self-manage quite a bit of that, not have to constantly worry about the workload that was going to them, especially with smaller issues and cases. So it's not just like a random bunch of game devs. We do have like a legal structure and a framework and backing in place as well. Um, but we, our casework team, we started that up end of last year, I think. And we've took on a fair number of cases. Um, and it's really interesting to see how common some issues are in the games industry and how many, what sort of the repeated worries people have that they come to us with, especially regarding things like contracts and things that are usually quite basic questions or issues, but nobody seems to realize how to answer them in the games industry because we don't discuss things like what are our rights, what responsibilities do our employers have. So being able to educate people even in sort of small ways like that is really powerful. And it encourages them to come back to us because they realize, oh yeah, I can do that. And I got it fixed. Well, why? What else can I do? Which is really great. Uh, one of the things we do internally to organize is we have regional groups. So these are, we have about four or five just now. Um, and they have chair and secretary that are elected by people within that region that then sit on our main elected branch. And they basically help support and organize workers in specific regions as well. Uh, we do cover the whole of the UK, but obviously different places have different issues. What happens in say Yorkshire would be different to some of the issues that may be arising in London, may be arising in Scotland. So having some fairly localized support and the ability to meet group people together and have them set up their own meetups there is quite useful. COVID has put a bit of a damper on that in person, which has sucked, but alas, we've, we've found ways around about it. One of the other things we have are working groups and subcommittees. So these help with the branches workload. So as I mentioned, we have the casework group. We also have things like our comms group, which help with answering emails, sorting out our social media. Um, we have a few things that are sort of temporary. Those are sort of ongoing things. So we had a rebranding effort uh, finished up early this year, and we had people from the branch involved in that as well. So we can spin these up and sort of slow them down as we need them or as the members decide this is a thing I'd like to get involved in. So we really encourage people to be involved in their union that, union that way as well. We also have things like our BA, BAME group and our gender equality groups as well, which in addition to helping guide the branches direction, and representation and overall goals and making sure that we are not just, you know, led by a bunch of white dudes, 
These feed into the overarching IWGB as well. So every branch has these member, these officers, and there are union wide, there is a union wide group or meeting group for each one, and they feed into the whole union sort of structure as well. And some of the other things we have mentioned, uh, we do training, we do education, and generally we are looking, aiming towards getting workplace agreements in place, um, which is one of the things people will associate unions with, a union shop. It's the end goal, ideally for some people, is setting up a, a bargaining unit and a workplace agreement. It basically means that the workers in there have, it's been essentially a contract between that group and the workplace, and they can argue for whatever they want to be within it, and it gives them a lot more power to say no and change and empower their conditions. Sorry if I'm saying empower and power a lot. It's just one of those words that gets thrown around when it comes to organising and unionising. <laughs> and just make sure that's popped up because it's paying nothing. So in addition to empowering people, we also support our members. We've helped with a number of different issues, things like disciplinaries, dismissal claims, redundancy negotiations, workplace grievances, discrimination claims, all fairly heavy, fairly serious things. We are able to either help resolve those issues by being uh, providing advice, legal or just branch advice, depending on how serious it is, being a representative for any of the members in their meeting, which if you have a disciplinary or a redundancy meeting or anything like that, you have the right to representation, be it from a trade union member or another employee, um, and they can't deny you this, just as an FYI. And we've helped with redundancy negotiations, so helping people getting better payouts or deals if they are being made redundant and they can't get out of that or have their job made safe. And a few other things like that I can't really go into too much detail regarding the, the grievances and discriminations, but they have come up in the past and we have helped resolve those from members. And some small things like I mentioned before, things like contract support and negotiation, basically going through contracts for people, highlighting issues that might be a problem, or if they've got any questions that they're just not sure about, we can go through that. And kind of, so I've hinted at that with this regarding the COVID situation, but unionization in general has been a challenge for the past two decades or so. The number of young workers in the UK has gone down by roughly 50%. And um, there's been <laughs> successive anti-union governments over the past 30 odd years uh, that have severely hampered or weakened what trade unions can do. Uh, it sucks, but that's one of the reasons we, we, we have to keep fighting to make sure that uh, employment rights and liberties like that don't get eroded away and there's also some barriers that people have when it comes to unions so especially in the games industry there's things like apathy and this kind of applies to tech as well it's sort of like i'm secure in my job i don't need a union we don't need to be unionized that's for minors or that's for some other manual labor job which isn't true because you are a worker in the games industry, even though we work in a creative industry, it is very exciting, it is very liberating, very artistic for some people. It's still work. And I think quite a lot of the poor practices within the games industry by employers happen because they can exploit that. The people think, oh, I should be so honored and grateful to work in the games industry, but you're still working and you should still consider it like that. Uh, there's things like misconceptions. If you join a union, you're going to have to go on strike. You're going to have to do X, Y, and Z. And that's not the case, especially within ourselves. Anything that happens within a union is only done with the say-so of its members. In some situations, it will only be with the say-so of the members that are affected by a certain case. So if a workplace was going through redundancies and they wanted to strike and they balloted those members and they said, they came with an agreement, then yes, we would go off the strike for those people because that's what they chose to do. We can't, as a union, just say, yeah, you're going on strike now, deal with it. Um, some of the weirder things, <laughs> and especially with these quotes, is, is bosses and veterans speaking out against unionization. And the one on the right was one that I kind of had to take a double take on because, yeah, it's very strange when you see people take it like their stance on the death penalty is like similar to unions and it's just like 
okay, that's a very big reach. And it's, yeah, that's, I don't understand basically how people get to that point, but there it is. Some people in the industry, games and tech, do think like that. They're very anti-union because they have theirs. And, you know, especially in the US, there's probably some associations with unions and poor practices and things like that as well. The UK is slightly different, but we are a global industry and the US does heavily weight towards some discussions. One of the other main things, and this isn't just for unions itself, but in general without speaking out, is fear. What if my employer finds out? What if they sack me? What if they threaten me? Stuff like that as well. So it's an issue people face, and especially when it comes to union organisation or being a member of a union, legally you are protected. You can be a, a trade union member and you, you, they can't do anything about it, basically. Um, they can't ask if you're a trade union member either. It's a protected characteristic. Uh, the last thing that we mentioned here is financial concerns over membership fees, and that is an issue we're aware of. We know that the games industry, especially relative to what we do and some of the profits that it generates, people are paid for relatively poorly. Uh, some of the people that are probably at most of need of trade union representation or being part of a union are going to be the lower paid sort of jobs, juniors, QA, things like that. So it's something that we are aware of. It's something that WGB was set up as sort of because of this, because of they represent quite a lot of low paid um, migrant workers, people on zero hour contracts. It's the things they fight against as well. So we wanted to make sure that we have a barrier that is the low enough barrier, financial barrier of entry that people can join and not have to worry about it. So yeah, how do we tackle some of these challenges that I've just mentioned? I'm not really going to go through all of these because it is a big wall of text, but a lot of this does come to speaking to people, doing things like outreach via on social media, in person, in conferences, and doing things like talks, so things like this. Uh, we have been at other sort of, they say politically aligned talks and events, so the IWGB I um, think has been involved with the World Transformed down in Brighton a few times. Um, we do things like media training as well, so people know how to communicate, any, especially members if they're campaigning, how to speak to the media, make sure their points are made and they get across clearly. Most of the time on our end, especially as sort of the elected reps, it's being honest about what a union is, what it does and can't do. So we are not a cure-all. We can't fix everything just because you join or we exist. There is a lot of still quite a bit of work and it is all gradual changes, but it is all still doable. Um, <laughs> sorry, my phone just went there. Um, and yeah, other sort of more common things, taking on casework, winning, which we do quite a bit of as it trans transpires. Um, so since we've started, we've had basically consistent member growth for all set one month. A few different things have caused that. Some, some has been word of mouth, influence, awareness. Other things have been major events, be it sort of within our, the UK, where people are made redundant or realise that things may be happening soon, or sort of more global events like mass redundancies, things like the blizzard mass redundancies that happen, things like people coming out against sort of the sexual harassment riot and realising that maybe they need protection legally or legal support or solidarity or basically a way to group together. <laughs> uh, so these things do help contribute, even though they are generally negative things, like people shouldn't have to go through these, but it does contribute to awareness and pe make people realise that maybe we do need a union or representation in that way. Uh, we have taken on dozens to hundreds, because I'm not quite sure how many. <laughs> it's definitely in three figures of cases and issues, both big and small, some of which that I've mentioned before. We've had a pretty solid success rate. I think it's at least 90% in resolving those for positively for our members. And we've got hundreds of members currently and looking to grow that in the future. So, yeah. It's not just a UK only thing. There are international movements, organizations, bodies. Everybody's looking to make, make this happen. It can't, we can't just be focused on our own small collective. Improving things here means we also need to work on improving things elsewhere. There were a couple of articles that came out 
was it earlier this year? I'm pretty sure it was People Make Games also did a video on it about essentially out show, out, outsourcing crunch, for lack of a better term. So we can't just worry about improving things here and then that's it, it's a solved issue because other workforces in other countries could equally, easily be exploited as well. So I'm going to give you an example of workers coming together. So Voltage Entertainment uh, worked in a game called Buffstruck. So this is basically an example of what I think still is the first successful US game worker strike last year. Um, and my phone's just gone, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, so basically a group of writers at Lovestruck, about 20 people, um, came together, spoke to the Code CWA, which is a union in the US, um, because they had a number of issues regarding their poor pay. They were being paid about 3.5 cents per word. Their poor working conditions, they were producing a lot of content in a very short turnaround, and it was basically long working days for them. Uh, they wanted greater transparency on not only what they were working on, but what the company was looking to do strategy-wise in the future. And they wanted increased workplace protections as well. So all of the workers that went on strike were uh, freelance, basically contractors. They weren't salaried employees, so they had very few protections. But they won, which is the main thing. <laughs> and there was a couple of reasons, like, good outcomes from that. One of the main things that we saw, like you can see was the fans and the, they supported the workers. They realized that, yeah, actually we want the people that make our games and make the stuff that we really love to have better work conditions because we don't want them burning out. They deserve to have a good living. And I think that's really crucial in terms of solidarity. Again, a word I will probably repeat quite a lot. Um, get, making people realize that games don't appear out of a vacuum and they, they should be thankful for making them is really important. It's not just people who work within the games industry who need to realise it as work, it's the people that, I hate this word, consume um, games or play games, realise that yeah, it's work as well, it's a creative endeavour and people should be rewarded and treated fairly for that work. But one of the big things was, as well was that the victory wasn't just for those that went on strike. The, they got improved conditions, so they got almost double of their pay per watt. They ended up getting longer de deadlines and not having as much content to produce for those deadlines as well. But it applied to all of the writers, not just the 20 or so that went on strike. And that's one of the big things with collective action. It's not just a, oh yeah, like these little group of people are in the union, so it just applies to them. It can apply to everybody, especially when it comes to workplace bargaining as well. You can make that apply to the entire workforce, or most of the time they'll try and split up into smaller groups, but lots of people, not just members. And yeah, it's one of these quotes, one of these things that... Uh, uh, our previous chair mentioned in a previous talk that I want to reference is workers can successfully create change when they combine and exercise their power. It's not just about joining the union, it's about doing something with those people, especially in your workplace or outside of it, and make things happen. Whew, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> um, so just now I'm going to go over some workers' rights. Um, just to give you a heads up, it's a little bit text dense and maybe a little bit dry. I should have flung some pictures of a cat in it just to space it out a little bit more. Um, but as I mentioned, very few games industry workers we speak to or come to us with issues are aware of what their rights are. Um, one thing to note about trade union sort of assistance is that we can only help people after with issues after they join the trade union. We can't help with historical issues. This is a legal thing. We'd love to be able to help people if we could. Thank you, Tory government. Um, but even if you don't feel that you want to join a union right now, knowing stuff like this will help you be better prepared in case some things happen. Um, so we'll cover some of the rights, some less obvious ones, address a few misconceptions. It won't be exhaustive, but we have some links if you want to read up on stuff after this as well. So one thing is workers' rights. Would you realise that unions help to make these happen? Things like the weekend, paid holidays, sick pay, maximum working hours, things like health and safety and parental leave. These things are things that people had to basically fight for. And it seems really weird now that, you know, oh yeah, the weekend, that makes sense. Yeah, you should have holidays or paid sick pay. 
but people have had to argue for these in the past. In some places in the world, they might not necessarily ha have them or they're really poor. So to go over some basic rights that you have, one of the main ones is discrimination, uh, which is covered by the Equality Act 2010. And it covers a number of what are called protected characteristics, which are listed here. So even if a boss or colleague is joking or being ironic or it's not directly in that you, you can, it's still a form of discrimination. And I'm not saying that you need to immediately make a union complaint, but if you feel an issue has happened and you want to raise that, you can with HR or whoever you want to be and try and resolve it internally that way. Um, but obviously if it's a serious issue, please, if you're part of a union, let us know. <laughs> um, if you have a disability as well, uh, your employer must take reasonable steps to support you. Um, including long-term illnesses that you cannot be discriminated against because of your if you have any physical impairments either. Um, so that is one thing to be aware of. One other thing is the working time directive. So as I mentioned, maximum working hours are a thing. Uh, this is based, original. It was based off of the EU working time directive, but it still applies to the UK, even though we have left the EU. Um, there is a legal limit of 40 hours per week and some additional subdivisions on top of that as well spread over X number of days. But this is an optional thing, so you can opt out of it. And most of the time, if you are joining a games company, you either have this as part of your contract or be asked to sign this alongside it. Legally, it has to be a separate written document. It cannot be part of your employment contract and it must be voluntary and in writing. But even if you do sign it, as because you are concerned about it, you can also legally opt back into the working time directive and it can't be held against you as well. You have to give written notice. Um, and as it says there, you have to give at least one week. It can be up to three months. But legally, if you are opted back into that, you cannot work for more than 40 hours over six days, I think it is. I will double check. But it's one of those interesting things that one of the first things you sign in as joining the games industry is, yeah, we want you to work as many hours as we might need. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. We don't crunch here, is a usual refrain. And it's just like, cool, so why am I signing away my rights to not work more than this number of hours? <laughs> Uh, semi-related uh, rest breaks. So by law, you are supposed to get three of these at work, daily rest, weekly rest. If you more work in more than six hour blocks, you have to get a minimum 20 hour, 20 hour, that'd be nice, 20 minute rest break. <laughs> and if you work for, um, you have to have a minimum of 11 hours rest that is not working between each working day. So for example, it, you basically can't work more than 14 hours a day without like in one row because, and then go straight into like a nine o'clock start because you need your 11 hours. And you are supposed to get a minimum of one whole day, 24 hours per week or 40 hours each fortnight. That's sort of in relation to different types of work. So people who do long shift work, for example, they might not be able to do it on a weekly basis. So it's fortnightly. Uh, we briefly discussed this one as well, but union involvement. So one of the main worries people have when they think about organizing or joining the union is, how can they target me? Will this be a held against me? Legally, it can't be. And you don't need to let your employer know. Even if they do know, for whatever reason they found out, they cannot treat you differently or unfairly. Um, and if you think you are being treated unfairly, or in a manner, a different manner, because you are a member of a union, you should contact your union, provide them with evidence, and they can raise a case against your employer for it. But being very public and vocal about your, your involvement within a union and your workplace isn't necessarily the best idea immediately, regardless of how friendly your workplace might be. Um, people might still look for other reasons to critique you or try and discipline you. So if you are looking to speak to people, please be safe, treat everything in confidence that's said to you, try and be the same with other people if you're telling them and get a group of people together. Where was I going with that? 
oh, I've lost my train of thought with that one. Never mind. But we will come back to that later when we talk a little bit about organising. <laughs> uh, and one other thing to mention, because it's in contracts as well, if you see in your contract that the company does not recognise a trade union, that is in reference to any bargaining agreements that may be in place. It is not to your individual rights as a union member. You can still have a trade union represent you in things like disciplinaries, for example, or contact your employee employer on your behalf. So if they try to say, oh, we don't recognize a trade union, so we don't care, that doesn't fly either. A couple of miscellaneous topics. Um, office temperatures and a safe working environment, especially in relation to people going back to the office in COVID. So this is one that people often ask about. It is a bit of a strange one, but I kind of see why. There's no strict law about office temperatures, but it's supposed to be at a comfortable level and well ventilated. And if you find it is affecting your health, speak to your employer. I know I've worked in offices that, especially in the summer, have no air conditioning, have no ventilation. It gets nasty. It's something that they have to at least try and accommodate to some degree, even though legally there is no maximum or minimum. Uh, if you haven't been paid or if you've been paid late, technically that's illegal, surprise, um, and it would be a breach of employment contract. Um, you can do a few different things regarding that. The first thing to do is basically go, where's my money? And just hopefully resolve things quickly. Sometimes these things happen, especially with smaller companies, but if it becomes a repeat issue, you should speak to somebody for either legal advice, join a union, um, or things like citizens' advice as well. Um, as mentioned there, if you um, sometimes I say stuff and then realize I'm running it down as well, which is a bit of an issue here. Uh, one other things we also one other issue that also pops up is sharing salary information. So legally, you're allowed to discuss your salary with your coworkers. This can't be held against you if. Anybody in your company says otherwise, they're wrong. They may consider it unprofessional, but they can't stop you from doing it. Um, one, one thing that to consider here is why would they want you to not discuss your salary? Because you might realize that people are being paid differently, especially if people are in the same role and they're being paid differently, that's also illegal as well. Um, so if you, it's good to sometimes have these maybe slightly awkward conversations with people that you are friendly with or you do trust or do the same sort of job as you do within your company just to make sure that people are being paid the same because legally you're entitled to be paid the same repeating words again sorry it's been a long work day already <laughs> uh, and so lastly in basic rights there are actually different types of employment as well um, and in the games industry we see all three so a contracted employee, this is where you work exclusively for a company, you have a contract with them, uh, you're entitled to basically all of the things listed there, things like the minimum statutory wage, statutory holiday and rest breaks, the working time directive, uh, a minimum notice period, uh, redundancy pay, statutory sick pay, but these things can also be augmented by your contract, so you might have additional sort of payment methods and payment methods contractual obligations on top of that as well. So your statutory sick pay is like 50 pounds a week, 50, 60 pounds a week, but your company might give you full paid uh, sick days, any number of those, and protection against unlawful deductions from wages, such as them paying you late or them taking, I don't know, random charges off you for some reason, be it for like weird tax things as they claim it, despite the fact that they shouldn't. Uh, the one in brackets there is one of the, biggest sort of issues that we have is unfair dismissal protection, which you do have as a contracted employee, but only after you've been in a, a full time, well, an employee at the company for two con continuous years. If you are up for redundancy, redundancy? <laughs> sorry, uh, redundancy or uh, dismissal and it's before your two year mark, they don't necessarily need to give you a reason. They do not need to offer you a redundancy package, essentially. They just say, serve you, can just say, serve your notice goodbye. It sucks. Legally, it's tricky to argue to get more, but there are some sort of situations where you can consider unfair dismissal 
before that two year mark, especially in something like a uh, discrimination case as well. So if you believe you, you're being made redundant because of your gender, because of your religion, because of any health related issues as well, you can argue that case. Uh, casual zero hour workers have some rights like minimum wage, but or also don't have redundancy pay or statutory sick pay because the zero hour workers are not guaranteed that time. Contractors, you basically have to negotiate these things yourself for your contract. If you're self-employed, you give yourself what you want, basically. <laughs> it's, so yeah, um, kind of quick roundup of that. There is basically employees are better protected, but we, and especially the IWGB, are looking to improve the rates for casual zero hour workers and contractors as well. So our uh, game workers branch does cover those people. It's not just for full time employees. People, not just workers, but employers aren't necessarily familiar with unionization, which actually helps us quite a bit <laughs> um, because we can point out some of these really basic flaws that happen and get them addressed really quickly. And with us keep pushing like that, hopefully it means that they'll stop doing it. But so far, we've not seen that happen quite yet. Um, if you do get dismissed for whatever reason, even if it's before your two year mark, you should contact the union just to be safe or because there may be an issue that you could raise that the union could then raise on your behalf. Um, like I said, discrimination is just one of those vectors. One other thing that often comes up with, is performance related issues. Uh, when people raise these, one of the things we always ask people is what metrics are they tracking? How can your employer prove that your performance targets haven't been met? Basically, a lot of these things come down to it. They will say a thing, but not necessarily have evidence for it. And we work with any members who have these issues to basically say, do you have the evidence that you have done your work satisfactorily, be it one-to-ones, any... KPIs, things like that, and argue against it that way. And we have won a number of cases um, that way as well, even if it's just getting rid of the sort of disciplinary meeting and having it sort of written off. And again, just to reiterate, you can only get help with a union legally for issues that occur after you join. We do offer some general advice to people. We have sort of uh, publicly facing resources, one of which I'll link to, and I will double check we, we have a sort of wiki notion page that may be public facing. I don't know if we're still working on that site that I can send through to be shared as well with a few different resources as well. But here are some here. You can contact us above. ACAS is pretty crucial if you're worried about redundancy or disciplinaries. They cover, they're basically a set of guidelines that employers should follow. Um, they cover things from the employee and employer standpoints as well. So you can read up in both and make sure that they are following what they need to be following as well. There's another couple of links uh, in relation to the UK government's website. So um, that unionization 101 fact sheet, I will have link to or get shared around as well. It's basically a two pager. There's a pop up actually if I click here. So it basically covers very briefly what your rights are, any potential issues that you might face, and a little bit about organising as well. So just a quick little document. And where did I can go? And there, there's some other links as well, just regarding employment law. And uh, so yeah, getting involved. What one thing, if you do want to get involved, is just like, what do you want to do? <laughs> what do you? What are the things you'd like to change within the industry? And here is. A massive list of possibilities. Some of them are lofty, and, but none of them are necessarily impossible. They may just take a little bit longer to achieve. Um, and uh, people coming together and working towards these goals, be it in unions or other organizing campaigns, we can make these happen. Four day working weeks, just like even last year, were probably considered like, yeah, that's definitely not going to happen. But more and more, we see not just general things but games companies rolling those out so these things are happening already so yeah we don't want it what people want to do as part of a union if they want to make a campaign going for any of these we look to support it in whatever way we can and we do have some internal campaigns that we're working on as well especially because 
members have raised them. Things like, is it mentioned in this one? Double check. Uh, it's not work membership. No. Oh yeah, own your own side projects. So owning your own IP and that as well. It's a common issue across the games industry. It's essentially like a boilerplate thing that's existed in games employment contracts forever, despite the fact that really not necessary. And uh, people making their own work during their own time using their own equipment. The company's not paying their, their, their time for that, so why should they own it? But we'd really like to, you know, make sure that, that becomes an industry standard that no, they don't own anything that isn't related to what they do in their work hours or work projects. So how do you get involved? Join a union. <laughs> um, here's a link to our, uh, our joining page. If you search IWGB, it will pop up as well, and you can click the Game Workers little tab. Um, as mentioned, we are focused on participation, not just being this monolith that people message whenever they need a help. We are only as strong as the members. We are. We do what the members want. Everybody, like elected committee is called so because they're elected <laughs> and but that's the case across all of our branches who then make up the chair and vice chair of not chair vice chair chair and secretary of each branch make up the executive executive committee for the whole union and they help kind of guide those decisions as well um, as mentioned you can join working groups or committees to help shape the branch not necessarily ones that exist already if you think there's a need and um, for the union to look into different things. So stuff like, say, neurodiversity, we can set up a working group like that. We can speak to other branches to see if they have anything in place with that already or any or other work that they've done. And that's been one, one of the real strengths of being part of the IWGB is just these other branches have such a wealth of knowledge and information that we might not necessarily have or consider and they're willing to share it with us and we can do the same for them. So it's really cool to have that sort of worker solidarity across those different workspaces well, that I didn't say earlier and completely blanked on. <laughs> and one of the other main things is basically being there for each other, being like a solidarity and support network. We have a, a Discord set up for members and people go in there, they chat. If they have like a little issue, they can know they can ask it in there and people will ha happily answer it for them which is twofold great, well, multifold great actually. It means A, people are comfortable enough asking those questions now. Um, B, they know that it's an issue in the first place. And C, people are getting educated enough that we don't need to, as the like, executive, executive committee reps, answer it because other people know these are issues and how, what the answers are now. So it's kind of that, again, really low key training, I guess, if you want to call it that, like people learning through os osmosis. And it's been really great to see the Discord growing and various forms of engagement happening that way. Uh, one of the main things that we do do is training. So there's a few different types of training we can offer. The main one is organizer training. Basically, how do you organize a workplace? What are the different things you should do? Consider how, so stuff like speaking to people, things like workplace mapping, which is basically figuring out who do you think would be good to speak to a pro-union? Who do you think would be anti-union? Things like the EEIOU, which I can't remember what they all stand for, but it's a process of gathering people and getting them onto your cause and basically looking towards how do you make a collective action happen. Uh, IWGB recently, I think it was last month, started up their own internal school of organizing for all members to help deal with this because there's been such a demand and we, also arranged third party training with other organizations or other branches as well, but they've realized that this was happening quite a bit. So we may as well formalize this, which is really cool. It's free for all members. Sessions run, I think they have monthly sessions, but I'll double check. Um, and as mentioned, we have shared training and experiences with other branches. Um, some of the additional training that we can provide, especially if people want to focus on anything, uh, legal and case work, we call it preparation, but train there as well. Um, so if you want to help with some of the casework stuff, we can get you educated in a few different things, how to handle those, how to respond to cases, how to represent people appropriately during meetings and disputes, which is the next one, because I'm jumping ahead. The media training stuff that we mentioned as well. So not just how to speak to people as part of a campaign, but in general, how to, I hate to say the word propaganda, but you know, 
basically make people aware of the union, what they do, and also counteract any of the sort of counter narratives about worker organizing or unions that are untrue. Um, and we can basically arrange whatever we need, which has been pretty useful. Um, even though I've mentioned there quite a lot of this training happens internally, we do work with third parties like the Rosa Luxembourg Foundation. Uh, they run a series of trainings that I've forgotten the naming of, but it's really cool. And I will try and link to it at some point, sorry. But it's definitely worth looking at that as well. Um, but what else can you do even outside of joining the union? Um, one of the big things is supporting workers, supporting their campaigns, supporting any, them in any issues that they raise. If people raise an issue, help share that, make noise for them, make them feel supported. Even with the backing of a group of people, it's still really scary. People might think that they're going to get negative reactions to it, like the love struck writers, for example, but that swell of support really was really great to see and it really buoyed them as well when they were we had one of the workers speak at our AGM last year I believe and they basically said it really helps sell the fact that yeah we were right to do this we were right to try and better things for ourselves and people realize this but key to do key with this is to listen to what the workers want and not necessarily making decisions for themselves so stuff like don't boycott a company unless the workers say boycott the company. You can do use your own sort of personal uh, guidance if you want to play those games, but don't publicly say, oh, join a boycott. It's a boycott because it might not be. Uh, one of the other things to do is educate yourselves as well. There's lots and lots of lots of information out there about workers' rights and movements, both inside the UK and outside. Uh, if you want a good starting point, Labour Notes as a website. It also has some training documentation there. Uh, Pluto Press uh, has a lot of books on different subjects and it's really wide ranging. Um, as far as individual writers go, uh, Kim Kelly is, does a lot of union reporting, um, especially in the US. She also does some writing for Teen Vogue, which is a, a strange reference to make, but they actually, their sort of labour reporting is actually really good and especially sort of an introduction to sort of stuff and concepts as well so I do actually recommend that as well um, but yeah it's some of the stuff's fascinating one of the trainings we did as part of our BAME working group was how Indian workers organised there in a factory and it was just fascinating to see the history of people in the UK and how they've come together and sometimes it's not necessarily been supported by larger organizations for basically things like racism, because this was the 60s and 70s and they, there was a fear of their coming to take our jobs. And they were just like, no, we, we're not. We just want to be treated the same as everybody else. So, yeah, definitely check things out. And I will try and find other sort of books, websites that I can send through as well. It was really struggling with the list of length of this to begin with and I didn't want to fill up more text but yeah whew, that is me thank you for your time <laughs> we'll now take some questions